morning. Good morning. My name is Laura Gitman, and I lead BSR's office in New York, as well as oversee our global membership strategy. Five years ago, I launched BSR's financial services practice, and I'm proud to say that today we have more than 25 members in our financial services practice, led by my colleague, John Hodges. Those five years have also been a pretty volatile time for the financial services sector. But one of the ways that we feel we've had the most significant impact is in understanding the influence that investors and the finance community can have on companies in all of the industries really represented in this room today. This morning, we have the uh, opportunity to hear from someone whose firm actually spans all of the industries and geographies that are present here today. Someone who brings the insights of an investor to our discussion and who truly demonstrates the positive impact that an investment firm can have on driving sustainability. KKR's George Roberts founded KKR in 1976 and currently serves as co-chairman and co-CEO with his first cousin, Henry Kravitz. For those of you who don't know, KKR is a leading global investment firm with deep roots in private equity. The firm is known as one of the pioneers in the industry, and today KKR is one of the world's most successful investment management companies, investing in everything from real estate to energy and infrastructure to some of the most recognizable brands, such as Dollar General, Del Monte, GoDaddy, and Alliance Boots. BSR has been proud to partner with KKR over the past few years to help them launch a program on responsible sourcing to help improve sourcing and supply chain conditions across all of its portfolio companies. We've also partnered with KKR to help provide guidance and resources on environmental, social, and governance issues as part of its ongoing due diligence processes. I've had the honor of working with KKR, and they've truly been one of my favorite companies to work with for really two main reasons. First, it's incredibly empowering to work with an investment firm who's willing to use their leverage to help drive progress and sustainability because they understand that sustainability is a critical part about how they create value across their portfolio. And secondly, I work at BSR because I want to have an impact. And when I work with a firm like KKR, that impact is exponential. When I work on a single project, it's not just impacting one particular company but that change and that progress is actually driven across all of their portfolio companies. I think you'll really enjoy hearing about that exponential impact in just a few moments. Mr. Roberts has more than four decades of experience financing, analyzing, and investing in both public and private companies, as well as serving on the boards of a number of KKR portfolio companies. He also has a real personal passion for many of the themes that we've been discussing here this week, and is founder and chairman of the board of Red F, a San Francisco venture philanthropy organization that creates jobs and employment opportunities for people facing the greatest barriers to work. You've probably seen enough presentations this week, so we're just gonna dive right into the discussion. And about halfway through, I'll invite you to join me in that conversation. There are actually index cards on your tables, or you can tweet to BSR 13 your questions, and we'll be happy to take questions on, on anything for which Mr. Roberts will be able to provide his really unique perspective. So with that, please join me in welcoming George Roberts to the stage. George, thank you so much for being here this morning. Most of our audience doesn't necessarily know what private equity is. Uh, many in our audience are not really immersed in the investment world. So perhaps we can start if you can just give us your perspective and describe what you do at KKR. Un unveil the black box a little bit and tell us how you think about your investment portfolio. Well, sure. Well, to the extent the audience uh, is not familiar with private equity, neither is most of the people in the world. So. <laughs> You know, don't don't feel alone. It's probably uh, one of the most misunderstood uh, forms of investment of anything that I've seen in in the 47, 48 years that I've been working. Basically, we started out with a, a premise, and, and this was even before starting KKR, that if we made management owners or partial owners of businesses, uh, those businesses would be run better and value would be created for all the investors in that company. That was a simple thing that sounds pretty simple today, but wasn't really recognized and done 
back in the 60s and 70s and even 80s when we got started. And really what we do is we, we make an investment uh, in businesses. Uh, some of them as familiar names uh, to you all as Safeway out here. And we put in processes and go governance in those businesses to drive creating va more value than when we made the investment in the first place. 80% of whatever value uh, that's increased or profits that come from those investments go to the people that have entrusted us with their capital uh, to invest. Uh, some of those people are uh, uh, members of, of pension funds and public pension funds. There's over 40 million Americans whose pension in some way, uh, either future pension payments or existing ones, were influenced by what a good job or poor job that, that we do. So when I you know, was thinking about coming here today and, and talking to the group, I've been involved personally in about 250 transactions that we've done since we started KKR, which is basically all of them. And where we've been successful, we've been able to create more value uh, in the business. By that I mean sales, profitability, and growth potential than was there before we got there. And when we have not been successful, which we have not been in, in several incidences, we haven't been able to do that. And there's very variable reasons for that. So simple things that we would, we would typically do. Um, we bought uh, Dollar General. Uh, the company was having some, some issues. It was listed on the New York Stock Exchange as substantial size company, uh, but they had sort of lost their way. Uh, the stores didn't have standards. The restrooms weren't clean. Uh, the people that worked in the store hadn't gotten a bonus in about three or four years, so they weren't as friendly as maybe they would have been in, in a su successful company. Uh, the merchandise was not properly displayed, and I could go on through a list of things that, that were done. It was basically blocking and tackling. So we brought in new management, set new standards, uh, developed private label, which your organization helped us do and source outside the United States. And lo and behold, you know, the company probably has a $17 billion market value today. That value has been created over the last seven, seven years that, that we've owned it. And KKR, plus the people that, whose money we invest have profited uh, from that investment. So if there's one message I can leave you with today, it's that the way we invest is to take the capital we have and the human capital that we bring to it. We have over 66 people around the world who do nothing but get involved in, in helping to improve the businesses. That's our group called KKR's Capstone. And they go into the company, set up matrices, and, and really get their hands dirty in terms of helping management do that. But if you can only remember one thing that, that we private equity does, when they're successful, is to create more value that was there uh, when, when the investment is exited or sold than it was before we did. Great. Our theme this week is, is the power of networks. Um, and in many ways, you, you really manage your portfolio as a network. Um, one of the things that I've really learned about working with KKR, and, and you just touched on it, is that you bring much more than just capital to your investments. So you bring that network. You, br you share best practices across your portfolio. You bring your human capital and your industry expertise. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about networks and, and why you work with your companies as, as real partners as opposed to just investment targets? Well, we try to work with everybody as real partners, including uh, your organization, where you've helped us as, as well. I mean, you know, you don't know what you don't know, right? So the best thing to do is to go find people that know something about some of the goals that you're trying to accomplish. So when you look at KKR's portfolio today, um, from three of us having started the firm in 1976, and Jerry Kohlberg, Henry Kravis, and myself, and Henry and I still working. We have 82 investments in 82 companies around the world. Uh, and
and we have 18 offices around the world. We're in every country we want to uh, do business in. Uh, those companies combined uh, do close to $200 billion a year in revenue and employ a million people around the world. So we've got real responsibilities to everything that we do and everyone we touch. So as a result, we started uh, uh, both, the, uh, both the government affairs uh, part of KKR a number of years ago, as well as uh, the group that Ken uh, heads in ESG, as well as a global institute in terms of uh, macro and political and geopolitical uh, areas as well. And we try to get all of that harnessed into everything that we're doing around the world and all the investments uh, that we might be making and try to get smarter about everything that we're doing. Uh, KQR today still is a small firm, with, despite the growth we've had. We have about 1,000 a, a people around the world, so we need to have a bigger network uh, with everything that we're doing to make sure that we're doing what we ought to be doing. And in, and in my uh, business career, what I've seen is, is the world shifted to that of strictly shareholder value to one of shared values, which I think is, is permeating uh, in everything that business does uh, around the world today of what you're doing. So you need to, you need to connect yourself uh, with the people that really can help you achieve your goals. And building networks and relationships, obviously, is a very important way to do that. So let's talk a little bit more about value creation, because that's essentially what your firm is, is set up to do, is, is to create value. And in many ways, you view environmental, social, and governance issues in your, your work in those areas as simply a means to creating value. Um, and that's led to the development of the responsible sourcing program that we work on. But you have a number of distinct programs in your, your ESG platform. So you work on employee health and wellness across your portfolio. You work on greening operations across your portfolio. Tell us a little bit more about how and why you think about ESG and what the link is to value creation. Sure. Well, <clears throat> again, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know. So this really started with a partnership with the Environmental uh, Defense Fund uh, back in 2008. And uh, Fred Krupp, who runs that, has a reputation of working with businesses to try to solve, solve problems. And he came to us and said, you know, you all have a lot of investments around the world. Have you ever looked at, at the effect that some of these companies are having on the environment and what it's costing those companies uh, to manage that? And quite frankly, we said, no, we didn't. I mean, you know, you know the obvious ones, if you, if you make investments in certain types of industries, they have certain environmental issues with it. <coughs> but, you know, we didn't know. So we started a pilot program in terms of actually measuring um, the programs that were put in place and the results that would come out of those programs. And quite frankly, at first, I was skeptical, I, you know, in, in terms of I wanting to make sure that whatever we did, we could verify that these were really the results. And when we started out, people were throwing around numbers that, uh, you know, I wasn't sure that you could, you could verify. So between our accounting firm and Capstone and your organization and others, we set up metrices to measure exactly the results that would come from that. So we just finished uh, five years. Uh, we have 24 companies in the program uh, today. And just to give you a few quick, quick statistics, uh, that's resulted in uh, 1.8 million metric tons less of greenhouse emissions and over 650,000 tons of waste that's been avoided. And you can put dollars to that uh, if, you, if you want to uh, throughout the portfolio, whether you can call it more revenue or cost avoidance, whatever it is, but the numbers are, are very meaningful. So it was a way of, of, of doing well and still doing good, a phrase that we use with, at the firm. And it, there were simple things. Uh, for example, uh, US Food Services has 
It's a national uh, organization that basically distributes food products to restaurants and colleges and, and probably to this hotel. And they have a fleet of trucks. So by rescheduling how deliveries are made and really looking at uh, our routes, maybe even in many cases looking at what customers, when you add an ESG factor into it, aren't profitable, we were able to reduce emissions dramatically. In the case of Dollar General, again, this is, you know, not knowing what you don't know. Uh, they basically threw away uh, all of the cardboard that uh, goods were packed in when they came to their warehouses. So we set up a recycling program that saved an awful lot of waste, and it created about $10 million a year of <coughs> real profit to Dollar General. So I could go through a list of uh, many of these with you, including a beer business in, in uh, uh career where we changed the, just the way the, the piping was done and the heating was done in, in the organization. <coughs> All of our companies have big data centers. There's huge savings could be made there in electricity. So just by emphasizing this and getting it down into the hands of the people that actually have to do the work uh, is really what it takes. And then you have to measure it. You have to provide the results for people. And in a couple of the cases they were, where there were multiple distribution centers, you had contests going on among the different people <coughs> about who could do the best job on this. And they would have monthly reports that they would get in terms of who was being more effective than the other group. So that's what you need to do. It's, it's fine for me or Ken or Henry or other people in our firm to say this is what we want to do. It's not going to happen unless you can get the people that actually have to do the work uh, sold to those, those programs. Excellent. I think we have a video that maybe describes that in a, a little bit more detail. So why don't we show the video and then we can talk a, a little bit more specifically about, about some of your efforts. We started our ESG program uh, about five years ago, and it stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Issues. I mean, if you can improve the operations that, uh, that you've invested in and be a good corporate citizen in the same breath, it's just good business sense to do it. You know, I've been working for 47 years, and the world's changed a lot. Uh, it's gone from strictly just shareholder value to shared values. The private equity model is about building better businesses, and we believe that environmental social governance issues are part of building better businesses. And, and frankly, the model that we have here in terms of our long-term focus, our alignment of interest, as well as our active management, makes it a, a very um, easy and important platform for thinking about these issues. We try to invest in companies in flexible ways that want us as a partner, that want our capital as well as our knowledge and expertise to help make them smarter and make them better. And then the next level is who's affected by that company, who are the stakeholders. And to accomplish a effective partnership there, we have outside partners. We have the Environmental Defense Fund, we have Business for Social Responsibility, we have Transparency International, we have the American Heart Association. Capstone is the operations arm for KKR. The Green Portfolio Program is all about helping companies as an operations executive. That's my mission. One of the great things about the partnership with KKR is how the company has really taken ownership of this program. Together we developed the tools to make it possible, but KKR has really taken it from there. It's become part of the DNA of KKR, and it's become the model for the private equity sector. The bottom line is that the world is never going to become less complex. And as companies grow, as we grow, as our investors grow, we are going to be dealing with more issues. I am confident that the work we're doing is just the foundation and that we're going to be growing uh, along with the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with. If you think about the size of KKO, we have over $200 billion in revenue in these companies. We can't ignore this. This is too big a footprint and too important 
to ignore. If a company doesn't take care of its own community and take care of its own backyard, uh, it's not going to grow. It will not reach the pinnacle of what it can achieve. You cannot be a good investor today unless you're going to focus on the stakeholder issues as well as the bottom line. I think that video makes a pretty powerful statement about how you, how you think about ESG, but if we were to poll the general public, if we were to poll investment professionals around the world, probably if we were to poll this audience, most people don't think about private equity or investment firms in general and sustainability in the same sentence. They think about them often as, as being more diametrically opposed. And, and the investment field has a reputation as being pretty ruthlessly focused on, on the bottom line. So how do you, do you agree with that reputation and, and how do you square that perspective with what, what we've seen in the video and, and what you've been talking about this morning? Well, look, I've, I've learned a long time ago that the only way to, to change perceptions is to deliver results. And that's what we try to do. And we try to stay the course, uh, stick to what uh, we're true to and the values that we're true to, and eventually, uh, the results and the truth will, will come out. And all we can do is control what we can control. And I think everyone uh, at the firm is, is very much tied into this. Uh, everyone at our firm does an awful lot of other things other than do their work in terms of what uh, they do in their own community. While it's not required of them, uh, that's where leadership comes from, and when they see the leaders of this firm doing other things to, uh, to uh, outside of their business interests, they get the message pretty quickly. So I think all we really can do is, is control our own uh, destiny, act in the most responsible way we can, uh, try to be leaders. Uh, I think that since we started uh, uh, the programs that we've started, uh, many of the other firms, private equity firms, have also joined in, and I think that's a great thing uh, to have happen. You know, private equity, unlike, um, you know, Company X, which is a big, big, widely owned, uh, diversified public company, could do some things uh, that the typical public company cannot do. For example, uh, we actually, uh, in many cases, control the ownership of these businesses. And so when we talk it, as a directors also, we talk as owners. And that has a far greater impact on the people that actually have to do the work uh, that we're, uh, than if you just come down with a, you know, a statement from the board of directors. In every investment committee that we have, uh, we have a list of ESG issues that we want to have answers to before we go make an investment in that business. So it's in, ingrained upon everyone in our firm that this is important. And I think if we do it uh, uh, long enough and we do it successfully, again, there's no substitute for performance, then the word will get out. Absolutely. So I want to step back a little bit from KKR and, and use this opportunity to, to pick your brain as a, a global leader in finance. Um, we've been talking a lot this week about the, the financial markets and about the um, the common perception that they're really suffering right now from this pervasive short-termism or the quarter-to-quarter -quarter mentality. And it's a really significant barrier to investing in, in anything long-term, but especially investing in sustainability, which is more inherently long-term. So I'd love to just get your thoughts as, as to how you think about that short-term perspective and bringing it back to KKR, how do you keep your customers and your investors patient for long-term financial success? Well, that's a good question. You know, the, if I were to ask the audience um, how uh, quickly does a registry of a typical public company turn over, uh, one year, two years, six months, nine months, my guess is that most of you would get that wrong. It's close to nine months. So it's a very short period of time uh, that the registry basically of a public company uh, would change hands. 
And that puts a lot of pressure on quarter to quarter results uh, and even a little bit past that. So when the investors in your business, the people that work at Fidelity or some of the large, large um, mutual funds, the portfolio manager, they're paid based upon the results that they generate with their investment ideas. So they're in there to, like all the rest of us, is to get paid, right? And so it sort of starts with that, which what is the motivation of the people that own your shares? And in many cases, it's what am I going to get paid next year for or this year for what I did during the year? What are my performance results, which is driving the value of the shares up? Private equity, on the other hand, uh, our average holding period is close to eight years of every investment we've been in. And we get paid only by the difference between the value the company had when we made the investment to the value when we actually exit that investment. So it gives us a longer period of time. We don't have reporting to the public. Uh, we can rearrange uh, a lot of those businesses and maybe get out of some things that don't work, get in some that do. And you can put in the, the programs and practices that you want to do without having to worry about what your next quarter is going to be. I'm sure that's why one of the re motivations that Michael Dell had for taking Dell pub private from a public company. Uh, there's probably some businesses that he will get out of, some costs he'll get out of, and some new investments that he wants to make that probably for the next three or four years uh, won't really have any payoffs. And ESG is an investment. You know, we have uh, probably 20 plus people in KKR alone today than we did five years ago doing nothing but this. And uh, when you look through how all this impacts the, the different companies and what they have to do, they have more people doing it. So you, you have to be focused on the long term and building value over a period of time to do that. And you've got to have a commitment that this is the right thing to do. And you know, I think there's so many other things that go into a, you know, a profitable business than just what your bottom line is. I mean, for example, uh, if you have a workforce that really isn't happy going to work every day, how much productivity have you lost? Uh, what we've found, um, at least in interviewing uh, younger people today, that one of the first things they look at uh, on our website is what we're doing in ESG. And some of the first questions I get are, are about that. Uh, so people want to do the right thing, and they want to be associated with companies that do that. So I look at that as a competitive advantage, quite frankly, for us, to be able to get the best and brightest people that want to be at the firm, going to be proud of it, and going to be the most productive. So I think you have to look at more than just what is your profit this year. You have to look at how this helps you grow your business, uh, the human capital that you can attract and keep uh, in, in the organizations you have, and you need to take that point of view and everything that you're going to do in this area. You know, many, uh, many times I hear that companies, that, that private companies are, have the luxury of being private, and, and I think that follows up on what you're just talking about. And yet a lot of the companies in our, our audience are major global public companies. So what advice do you have for them in how they can convince their investors and respond to investors who don't necessarily have the long-term perspective that you're talking about? Well, come see me after the conference and we'll go private. <laughs> Look, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I think everybody uh, can buy in to most of the things that are being done with ESG. And if it's done in a, in a collaborative way where uh, your organizations and others come in to see the, the CEOs and the decision makers of larger companies, and frame this in a win-win situation, that's what's needed to be done. And that was what has been so impressive about your organization, and it's been very impressive about the Environmental Defense Fund, is that's how people have approached it. You know, most companies, like I said earlier, don't know what they don't know. I certainly was unaware of, of many of the things that I'm aware of today, and uh, you know, just by being educated by people that have much more knowledge than I have. So I don't think it's hard to do. 
I think it just has to be a, a dialogue and a discussion uh, and a collaboration as opposed to any adversarial ways of approaching. Absolutely. I have a, a few more questions for you, but I'm going to start to take questions from all of you in just a moment. So if you do have a question on an index card, just raise your hand and, and someone will come around to, to grab it. Um, and you can also continue to, to tweet your questions. I know a few have already come in. Um, so we, we've talked a lot this week about energy. And I know invest, uh, energy is a, a key investing theme for KKR. And achieving a sustainable energy future is a pretty complicated matter that, that certainly is challenging our policymakers, corporations, investors, civil society. And a critical element is around financing for sustainable energy solutions. But there, the other side of that is how to balance that with ensuring there's enough supply to meet the rising global demand. So I'd love to just get your perspective about how you think about your investments in energy, how ESG perhaps has informed those investments. And there's a lot of buzz around the, the natural gas revolution. So I want to get your thoughts on that as well. Sure. How much time do you have? <laughs> well, look, I grew up in, in, in Texas, and uh, my grandfather, who I did, never knew, but, uh, and my father were both in the, the oil and gas industry. And what the, the changes that have taken place today, uh, you know, in the quote old world, you know, you, you drilled a hole vertically and you hoped you would find something. That's changed today. Now, you know, because of the, the technology that that's, we have today, that the, the source rock for all oil and gas, and that's probably 200 million years old, is there. Now, it might have fractured and created the, you know, the hydrocarbons, or it still might be there in a rock form. And these rocks are about this thick. And the technology that's uh, uh, been advanced today is called fracking. And what takes place is that you drill a mile this way and call it a mile down in, in the earth and maybe there are 10 cores that are set along those lines. And then the water and sand is forced down the boreholes into the rocks, the shale rocks, and they break up the rocks and they become uh, permeable enough to release the oil and gas that are in the rocks. Again, these are the same, very same rocks that produced oil and gas uh, in different parts of the country at one time. So the, the question and the risk has gone from do we drill this drill vertical hole and do we find anything? Or yeah, we, we know all this is there. Now what is the cost and what's the rate of return on investment to be able to make this uh, well and do what we need to do? So the wells that I'm describing that go horizontally are about $8 million. The ones that go this way are about a $1 million. So this has changed uh, the industry dramatically. And uh, rock that people never thought would generate oil or gas, now because of the technology is able to do it. And probably a fact that most of you aren't aware of is that most uh, oil and gas wells, conventional vertical wells, only really produce about 20% of the hydrocarbons that are there in the first place. Because at a certain point of time, you start uh, developing um, uh, water and, and other elements that you have to dispose of, and it becomes very, very uh, uh, commercially uneconomically to do it. So what you have now in the United States is, depending on whose, whose reports you want to use, uh, over 100 years of energy independence if we were to go out and do it. And to just to give you some example of the economic impact of that, you know, Henry Hub gas is $3.50. LNG in, uh, exported to Asia is $14. To Europe, it's 9 or 10 so we have a competitive advantage in this country today with the rest of the world, and believe me, you know, we compete with the rest of the world in everything we do, of energy that's you know, uh, never been here before. 
And when you think about what we could do with respect to energy independence and not having to rely on, on parts of the world that are less stable, I guess one report showed that in 20 years we could be totally energy independent if we, if we invested the capital uh, to go do that. So we, we're blessed with an abundance. Now, with that, uh, because we're in different territory uh, in terms of technology and what all this means, comes responsibility to have best practices so that when you're entering into areas and you're, and you're doing your horizontal drilling and your fracking, that you know exactly all of, the, uh, all of the results that could come from this. The state of Texas has probably done this better than anyone uh, in terms of the rules and regulations they have. Obviously, they've been the largest uh, state with respect to oil and gas over, over a long period of time. And so the you know, um, regulations and procedures have to be developed for the rest of the country uh, that really safeguard uh, what we do. And, and many of the major companies, I know we are too, and the things we have, are involved in all the different studies of ways to make this the best that you can make. And the one area that I think is, is key to try to figure some of this out, and this is whether it's you know, horizontal fracking or whether it's conventional, is actually how much, and, and storage, by the way, is it actually how much methane gas leaks once it's brought to the surface of, of what, what you're doing. So the, the, the industry has a long way to go. Um, the best, best practice in the industry are open book about uh, the results and trying to make this better and make it as safe as it possibly can uh, so that we can make sure that all the, all the interests are there that, 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 that are protected. But if you just look at Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, New York alone, those are states that heretofore people never thought they had any oil and gas reserves to do. So give you some example of what, what all that uh, potentially could mean for the country. Great, I think we'll probably have some questions on that, but I'll, I'll let the audience follow up. <laughs> it's not simple. <laughs> um, you know, you talked before about how you have to demonstrate performance. Um, and I'm curious how you do that in some of the areas in ESG. So let's take the work we do with you on, on responsible sourcing. In many ways, that's about mitigating risk. So it's about reducing some of your risk potential um, rather than creating upside returns. How do you then measure the, the results? How do you measure performance? And how do you communicate that to, to your clients? Okay. Well, that's a very good question. Well, first of all, it's not you know, just managing risk. It's, in many cases, it's avoiding it. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the best things you do in life are the things you don't do uh, from an investment standpoint. And you all have helped us in many regards there, too. It's also when, you know, we found uh, that many of the companies that sourced overseas uh, had never really been over there. Uh, you know, I know that sounds strange, but the people had never really visited who their suppliers were. And many of those suppliers had practices, several of those suppliers had practices that, that didn't meet the standards that we had set up. And typically what you would find in that is the people that work in those factories uh, or, uh, you know, aren't happy. And if they're not happy, how productive they are there, and it goes through the whole, the whole chain of things. So, you know, you all have helped us uh, avoid some really uh, bad mistakes, and then you've helped us with our suppliers help make them better, which helps make the investments we have better, too. Great. Um, so last question from me, and, and that is one of the, the themes that we've also talked about this week, and earlier this week we announced a new initiative for BSR called Business Leadership for an Inclusive Economy. And I know that's, that's something that's, that's near and dear to your heart, having founded Red F, the, the Roberts Enterprise Development Fund, here in San Francisco, which works to create employment opportunities for, right. for people who um, typically face the greatest barriers to work. I'd love to get your perspective on, on the role and the, the the network connections between social enterprises and the private sector in really contributing to that concept of an inclusive economy? Well, <clears throat> we started, uh, my wife and I started Red F uh, 16 years ago. And the premises of this was, 
you know, if people didn't have jobs, uh, they didn't have hope, and if you don't have hope, you know, what do you have? And the people that work in the organizations that we help, and what we've done is we've taken the same approach to this that we've done at KKR, and that is we'll provide capital and some consulting and management help uh, in nonprofit businesses to help them grow their employment and hire the folks that we try to serve. So the folks that we try to serve uh, are people that want to work and they're able to work, but uh, for one reason or another have, have been dealt a bad hand. So uh, the population has either been in jail, had substance abuse problems, uh, had other, other issues. Many of the, at least women, have come from abuse uh, relationships and are disabled in, in one form or another. So it's that group of people that we're trying to get employment from, get employment for, and the different social enterprises that Carla and her team uh, provide capital for and advice for. Uh, and we've had, we're strictly California to date. Uh, we're trying to expand nationally uh, or help groups like us, ours expand nationally. I think we've had 7,700 people uh, uh, go through this program. And at least the ones we, that have been interviewed have been able to stay in a job uh, at least for two years, 76% of them, and have been able to dramatically move up their standard of living in terms of, in many cases, a, just a place to live and some type of health insurance and, and, a, and, a, monthly, and a monthly paycheck. So it's really taking what I think has made our firm successful, and that is provide capital, both financial capital and human capital, to help create value in the things that we do and the organizations we help, instead of paying a dividend to the shareholders, reinvest the money back in training uh, the very people that, that we were talking about. And when we had our, our annual uh, Red F dinner this year, uh, there was a young man uh, by the name of Patrick who had been uh, he was the honoree. He had been in jail for 28 years uh, from Southern California, uh, got out, decided that he was definitely going to change his life, uh, went through one of the organizations, and now actually manages a building. And he got up with the biggest grin that I've seen of anybody and said, you know, I'm proud to be a taxpayer. So these are the kind of people we're trying to help, uh, and we're trying to... Uh, uh, get the results of what we've been able to achieve more on a national scale. Carla's doing a great job of that and see what other organ other parts of the country want to do what we're doing. That's amazing. You know, we, we often talk about using our core competencies, and so I really like that you're essentially using what you've built at KKR and, and applying it uh, for that social purpose, so that's great. So I've got a few questions and, and happy for you to, to continue to have them come in. Um, so the first question is, has KKR ever passed up on an investment opportunity because of an ESG-related issue or risk? And can uh, you actually tell us about that? <laughs> well, yes, and I'm not sure how much I could tell you, <laughs> but um, yes, we have. I mean, they're, they're, um, they're generally speaking in other parts of the world, uh, not, not in the United States, and it has generally comes in the, the category of... of uh, of potential corruption and or uh, 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 different labor practices. So there's been three transactions this year that have come to our um, investment committee that, that basically ESG screen hit and the, the, the people working on the investment idea had to go answer those questions and they came back in a, in a negative way so we killed it, yes. What sustainability challenge or issue is of most personal interest and concern to you? I kind of feel like a talk show host. So. <laughs> uh, personal interest. Yeah, personal interest. Well, there are, lot, uh, there are obviously a lot of them. You know, I would say the, you know, the environment um, is certainly number one in my, my mind. Uh, I started Environmental Center at Claremont McKenna where I went to school a number of years ago. 
Um, they actually, you know, study uh, uh, what can be done working with companies and measuring uh, the operations those companies have on the impact they have on the environment. Uh, students can actually get a degree in uh, economics, environment, and political science from, from that. Um, you know, I would say to me personally that's been um, something that, uh, that obviously I worry about um, and it's important. Absolutely. Are you concerned, excuse me, about high unemployment and growing inequality in the U.S.? And does this matter for the businesses that you invest in? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a it, softball. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, and it uh, matters a lot. And, you know, we see it at Red Oak. I mean, that's, that's the bottom 1% of people that are going to get a job. And when you have an economy that where many people have been out of work for over a year, uh, they've certainly become even less employable than, than they were. And, you know, we're not creating um, enough jobs in this country. Uh, that's the bottom line. If we can create jobs, uh, that's going to create opportunities for people. And you won't have this huge difference, quite frankly, uh, and what happens there. And, you know, we, we need, um, you know, I've said over and over again, I don't think we have an economic recession in this country. I think we have a political one. And we have a government that can't even agree on the few things that everybody, regardless of your persuasion politically, should be able to agree on. We should be able to agree on ways to, pro to have job growth in our country. And we don't seem to be doing that. People don't seem to be working and talking together. I, we had our CIO conference uh, last uh, 10 days ago in, in Washington, D.C., and we had people from both sides of the aisle come in and talk to us about what was going on in the budget crisis and all the rest of it. And it was... You know, I walked away from that saying, you know, I'm better informed, but I walked away being very depressed because I just didn't see any way that people were going to get in a room together and work this out without having another election in 14 and then another election in 16 and the people in this country being fed up enough about it to go do something about it. So until we can get an economy that's growing, more than 2%, uh, we aren't going to be able to create the jobs and that we need to really create the lack of disparity and, and uh, income levels and, up, quite frankly, opportunities that, that are done. When 40% when of the uh, young people don't graduate from high school, what kind of jobs are they going to get in a world today where, you know, to technology and everything else that's, that's taking place, what kind of jobs are they going to get? You know, it's not only uh, the United States. If you, I was in, the, in Asia three weeks ago, and I sat down and met with one of the ministers in the Singaporean government. Now, Singapore is three and a half million people in a very wealthy country. And I said, what's the biggest issues facing your country? He said the very same thing disparity in wealth, where would it create the jobs and the opportunities for people that, quite frankly, haven't made it yet. So, you know, there's lots of reasons for this, but we have to have uh, industrial policy in the United States that creates, has the goal, is to create good jobs for people. And if we can do that, then will solve an awful lot of the problems that we, that we have here. I, I think that's right, and, and it looks like the next question is, is picking up on the theme around public policy and, and what's going on with our government, and that is that you, you recently hired David Petraeus, and you, you hinted at this, as uh, chairman of the, the KKR Global Institute. Which public policy, regulatory, and tech trends do you expect to be focused on immediately with the Institute? Well, uh, he's a very unique man. Uh, in, uh, in terms of having a uh, stellar career in the military, 
Uh, he also has a PhD from Princeton, uh, is fluent in three different languages, and has a worldview that uh, is, is pretty unique. One, he's lived all over the world, and he has a sense of what's going on all over the world. And everything that have happens and affects our country, we're so global now, is happening somewhere else in the world. And it's good to have that insight and, and benefit of everything that we're doing and looking at some, from somebody as capable as he has. And he's built a team around him of, of younger people that, quite frankly, are just as smart, if not smarter, than he is, and that are really giving us insight into, you know, the global geopolitical, uh, you know, world that we live in. So it's, it's, it's pretty unique, and we're, we're very lucky to have them. And are you planning to, to this is my question, but are you planning on, uh, on making any of that public and so kind of contributing to public discourse on some of the issues that you're focusing on? Uh, in which ways do you mean? So depending on what macro issues you're looking at, you know, I think as we talk about job creation, as we talk about energy scenarios, there's a lot that could be um, contributed when we start to build a network of, of information that goes outside of KKR's four walls. Right, well, we do, and we actually publish things. Great. Uh, and be happy to send you copies of them. Sure. Sounds good. Uh, does KKR consider the reputational value of ESG opportunities to the companies in its portfolio, and how do you think about reputation in terms of dollars? Reputation in terms of dollars? Well, <laughs> look, I think the most important thing in life is your character, right? That's, that's really what, uh, you know, what, what, what matters and people are gonna, they're gonna people remember you by and do business with you by. So, um, that's really what matters. That's far more important than the dollars have ever been, and then far more important than dollars ever will be, um, you know, in terms of how we run our businesses and how we run our lives. Good. Um, is ESG and CSR a legitimate alternative to binding regulation? And you talked a little bit earlier about um, regulation in the, the energy industry. I, don't I can't know. follow up on the questions. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? You know, I, I think uh, it's a good question. It's it's it often is considered a, a, an alternative. Um, I, I think when we talk about having a level playing field and ensuring that um, it's not just the companies who get it and who are committed to doing what's right, but that you need regulation to ensure that it's not just your firm, but that it's being done across the industry. That's where I think we really do need regulation. Well. Think about it a minute. So if, if somebody in the state or federal government came to us and said, you have to do something, uh, I guess we would, we would do it, because they're telling us we have to, but do you think we'd be as enthusiastic about it as someone like you comes to us and said, hey, here's a win-win, let's work on this together? Yeah. Um, you know, I think you know, government has a role in certain, setting certain types of regulation that protects the public and, and does what it needs to do. Uh, but there's nothing like collaboration with, and relationship building with people that are like-minded with you. That's far more, uh, accomplished far more than anything that the government can possibly do. Good point. Uh, so the next question is about governance, and there's three questions here, so I'm gonna use my prerogative to pick one. Um, and that is, how do you manage having co-chairmen and co-CEOs, and what do you suggest for your portfolio companies regarding CEO-chairman separation? Well, uh, Henry, Henry and I have known each other since we were two years old. Um, you know, we went to college together, we were roommates when we had internship jobs uh, in, in New York during the summers. Um, you know, uh, he's probably closer than a, a brother to me than, 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 than anything else, and I'm sure he'd say the same thing. So uh, it, it works because of the um, personal trust and respect we have for one another, um, and it works really well. It's like having, um, you know, instead of one person, having two in, in terms of it. So. Um, you know, we probably could finish each other's sentences 
Um, you know, we have disagreements in terms of uh, certain things, and our style is different, but the substance is the same. And it's like any relationship, you know, I'm sure all of you would agree with me that really what matters in life is the relationships you build uh, far more than anything else. And to be able to have this kind of unique relationship that the two of us have, you know, quite frankly, is just, it's priceless. Uh, and I'm not sure other firms could do it or whatever it is, but it's, it's work for us and, and uh, hopefully it'll continue to, continue to, to, to work you know, pretty well for the firm. It also sets a, a pretty good tone with the rest of the people we have in terms of how they should act and they should work in partnerships with the people they have there and, and what a true relationship really, really means. Uh, you know, we had a, had a meeting with the firm not too long ago and one of the questions was, you know, do you and Henry ever disagree? Because uh, we never see you fight. And I said, one, well, we, we don't fight but we do disagree and then we sit down and we work out our differences and we have enough respect for one another to, you know, to, to make that happen. Your second question, should you, you know, separate the chairman of a company from the CEO? You know, I just think that depends on the company that you're, you know, that you're possibly, uh, you know, dealing with and the board governance, uh, you know, in those, in those businesses. I, I don't think you could have a general rule one way or the other. No one size fits all. Yeah. Um, so the last question, and it's a great question to close on. When the history of private equity is written, what will it say in terms of the net benefit to society? Uh, well, I'm not going to be here when it's written. <laughs> Look, I think that I go back to what I said earlier, that uh, it's, it's a very misunderstood uh, form of investing. Just to give you some idea of the, of the depth of it, there's over a trillion dollars in the world today that's committed to private equity that's uninvested. So in order to accumulate that kind of commitment and capital, and this comes from uh, government agencies, it comes from uh, public pension funds, private pension funds, individuals, endowments, uh, every organization that you can think of uh, that you touch with has, a, has an allocation to private equity today. So one, we must be doing something right. And secondly, uh, we must be doing it in the right way. Now it's not perfect, and I'll be the first to tell you it's not a risk-free form of investment, and we don't do everything perfectly either. Um, but we certainly try to do that. And we try to create value for our investors, value for the communities that we live in, value for the employees that, that work in those companies. And what we really try to do is to make that investment and everything we do better because we were here to do it than if we weren't here to do it in the first place. So that's what I would like to have it uh, basically say. Well, I think that's a, a really powerful message and, um, and hopefully everyone's leaving here much more informed about this approach to investment. And you probably will get a few people take you up on your offer to, to privatize afterwards. <laughs> but please join me in welcoming and thanking George Roberts. Thank you. Thank you.